Welcome to another edition of Test Me Time with me, Doug Harris. And today uh, I've got John Lawson with me. John, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having uh, me, Doug. God yeah, bless you. It's great. Well, I'll probably be happy to have you by the time we get to the end as well. But <laughs> uh, the, I mean, today you are prison director and evangelist with Avanti Ministries. Yes. And we'll end up there. That's not where you began. That's not where we need to begin. Mm -hmm. Let's begin back in your childhood in Glasgow and South Africa. What, what was it like? What was your upbringing like? Well, I was born uh, into a, a large family. My mother was one of um, six and my father was one of seven. Uh, we lived um, in a, an area of Glasgow called Mary Hill. Mary Hill in the 60s was one of the poorest areas of Glasgow, really. Um, my father was in the Merchant Navy, and when he, in one of his expeditions somewhere, he came across Durban in South Africa. And uh, I think you're of an age to remember. <laughs> At that time, there was a lot of special offers and deals to, right. to get families out of there. And so my mum, my dad, myself, when I was three years old, we left the tenement buildings of Mary Hill, and we ended up in South Africa. And that was a, a huge change for me with the warm sun and uh, yeah. sand and the beach. And uh, I grew up there, really a, life, a nice lifestyle. My father joined the police. Um, he had a fascination for guns. So for me, really being around weapons and guns, I used to help him make the bullets and, and go to the firing range as a young boy. For me, I had really, I, I don't have a lot to complain about. Um, but then at the age of 10, something in my life, in my parents' life, w was quite dramatic and it changed things for me. Um, they, they split up, didn't they, at, the, at, at that point? Yeah. Tell us what happened to you, and, and more than just physically what happened to you, but emotionally what happened to you at that time. Well, my, my brother was born out there as well, so it was me and my little brother, and mm, we got news one day that my grandfather had terminal cancer and that my mum really ought to come back home if she wants to see him again. So her and my little brother went home to the UK, I was in school, so I stayed there with my dad. Uh, during that time, however, my dad had an affair with another woman. And all along, he led my mum to believe that him and I would be following on and he was going to pack up everything in South Africa. Um, then one day, he picked me up from school and he, he locked me in the flat. And he said to me, I'm just going to go out shopping. I, I won't be long. And uh, well, he, he never came back. And about four days later, uh, some friends phoned and um, I actually have no memory of this. I'm telling you this from what people told me. Um, they kicked the door in and they, they got me out of this flat and they said I was a, a bit emotional. I guess you would be after being locked alone for four or five days. And I was put on a plane and sent home to my mum. And my grandfather soon died and my grandmother, she got very ill and she died shortly afterwards. And my mum, well, I could just remember my mum crying a lot at that time. And then of course my dad then phoned and said, don't even bother coming back. So as a young boy of 10, I was really angry. I hated the police. He was a policeman. And the only place really we could find to live at that point is we ended up living in a housing estate on the outskirts of Glasgow called Drumchapel. And Drumchapel at that time had a reputation of being the worst housing estate in the whole of Europe. I'd never experienced anything like that before. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you, you, you talk about being angry at the police and, 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 and you obviously traumatic experience that you had. Do, do, do you think that there are some of the sort of the seeds of violence that were going to come out later? Do, do, do you think that's where it began? It began there but it also began in the culture that I was living in. The, the housing estate, it's the first time I saw kids taking drugs or sniffing glue uh, and as the new kid and now here I was in the middle of a Glasgow housing estate um, with a, a bit of a posh accent. Uh, where the other kids might say ma or da, I would say mum or mummy, and uh, it soon attracted attention. I'd never been in a fight before, Doug, but I, I'd soon discovered in a new school uh, in Glasgow, the tradition was that the, the best fighter would come up and offer you out. And uh, I was too polite, I accepted this fight, I, I'd never been in a fight before. But that was the, the pinnacle, I guess, for violence for me, because I discovered, I don't know if you want to call it an ability, you know how some boxers, you, they, they have a glass jaw. You, you hit them once and they fall over and maybe other boxers like Ricky Hatton, you, you hit them all day with a baseball bat even and they won't fall down. Well, I fell into that category and I began to win many fights, not because of my skills, but 
they just couldn't seem to knock me down. Mm -hmm. And I learned from that young age that you got a lot of respect through using your fists and violence. And also I think I watched maybe too many John Wayne movies and you know, all those kind of things that you, you dealt, dealt with in a macho way. And the culture I was in, that's how you dealt with things, with mm -hmm. your fists. Mm -hmm. um, moving forward a few years, you moved down to Merseyside. Uh, yeah, um, we moved a few years later down to Birkenhead in Merseyside. And again, the whole new kid on the block. By now, I'd, I'd got really interested in martial arts, a lot of different forms of karate. What, 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 led, what was it? the violence or defending yourself, what, what led you into martial arts? I just got, I know it sounds a bit sick, but I got a bit of a thrill, uh, a bit of a kick when I was able to hit somebody or hurt somebody and, and defeat them. Um, that was just really my bad attitude. I didn't really get into martial arts for the whole self-defense, you know, uh, peaceful thing. For me, it was just a way to just um, demonstrate strength and power and I guess I became a bit of a bully with that as well. Mm. Um, it wasn't uh, for any other reason. And um, I got into it very, very heavily. Uh, as a young man, when I left school, the only thing I was good at was, was fighting. And uh, I went straight into the bodyguard, uh, sorry, the bouncer industry. Started mm. working in nightclubs as a young man. And so the cycle of violence uh, was just normal for me, you know. Um, the area that I lived in, again, another area was a very poor area. Um, I think even if we wanted to, to buy anything like a TV or a uh, DVD, I oh, didn't have DVDs then, but a <laughs> video player, yeah. everything was knockoff, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really know anyone in my circle of friends that could afford to go to a shop and buy things. So shoplifting was rife and as a young man I broke into many factories and just ended up just losing myself in the violence and getting involved in robberies and mm -hmm. all sorts of terrible things. As you said, you, uh, you, you got into the bouncer and then from then into being a bodyguard um, yeah yeah and I, I read somewhere that you, your your motto was hit them hard and, and then move on yeah um, now mm. that to me living a daily life like that I, I mean I can't even imagine it and and I wouldn't want it how did you cope with that sort of attitude every day I, I think it sounds stupid now but I think I had such high morals I thought I was the good guy I thought I was a good guy because I didn't do drugs, I wasn't a smoker, um, I didn't drink, I didn't beat my wife up or anything like that. And they all deserved it, you know. Our company began to use us to clean up troubled nightclubs. Mm -hmm. So I, I formed a team of men who were all ex-special forces and we would get sent to troubled nightclubs where the local bouncers couldn't handle the situation anymore. We would go very heavily armed with uh, shin pads and cricket boxes and, well, knuckle dusters and the works, you know, and uh, hit them hard clean up the, the nightclub and move on. So for me, violence again was just a means to an end. Mm. Um, the bodyguard industry was the next big thing for me. We began to work for some famous bands and I guess the pinnacle of that was, was working for the Rolling Stones one time. And I used to brag to people about working for the Rolling Stones. To be honest, Doug, it was the most boring job that I had. I don't really have any <laughs> Rolling Stones stories to tell you. <laughs> My job would be just to sit like I'm doing now in, in a corridor outside Keith Richards' room mm -hmm. in a hotel and uh, for 12 hours and just make sure he didn't get disturbed. And then the personal bodyguard team would take them to the gigs. Mm -hmm. So in fact, it was boring. And I was one of those guys. I always wanted more. I was never satisfied. Mm -hmm. Bigger house, bigger car, more money. And I was missing the thrill, the action that came from the, the fighting. Um, it sounds terrible. And in that circle where there's a lot of money, a lot of power, there's usually somebody somewhere owes somebody some money. And it wasn't long before those people would come to me and my team and ask if we were willing to collect debts. You know, they, they don't want to get their hands dirty. <laughs> and uh, I was only too happy to be involved in that. And um, we began to take incredible risks. The bodyguard work just fell away as I stepped more into crime. I worked for gangsters and all sorts of crazy people. C could you sleep at night? So, I mean, it sounds to me as if your conscience was almost so seared that mm. it, it didn't worry you. I mean, that's the impression uh, you're giving now. So uh, you, yeah. you could go home, you mm. know, after beating somebody up and, uh, and just go to sleep, no problem. Yeah, it, was, it, it is sick, you know. It is, it's, it's a sickness. And um, I was very cold. I had no compassion at all for, for anybody. I really believed that I was a good man. And... Um, I believe that those people had deserved it. Now, I'd never heard uh, much from the Bible. I never had any kind of Christian upbringing, but I'd heard this 
if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. I guess a lot of non-Christians would be even familiar with that. And that was how I justified it to myself. Look, you deserve it. You're a bad guy. You owe them some money, and I'm going to take it, mate. End of story. Right. If you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Yeah. And that's how really I finished. It. And yeah, I could go home. Um, I do remember, though, one incident. I must really, I'd love to tell you about. Please um, do. Uh, after I was a Christian, I was passing a particular garage. And I'm sure we're going to come to how I became a Christian, but yes, yeah, I feel it's yeah. important to bring this in. Mm -hmm. um, this particular garage was a place where I had to stop and, um, and wash out with a power hose the back of the van that had blood in it and, and other things. And um, Excuse me. Is it all right? Yeah, I find that hard. Right, yes. Uh, even now to think about that and to look at that. So as a Christian now, it's hard, yes. you know, but then, no you know, doing that, it was nothing for me and I could go home and be with my family. Mm. As you say, I mean, obviously a tremendous change has taken place. I mean, I, I'm glad I'm talking to you today and not back then, I do have to say that. But um, just before we get to the change and, and you're becoming a Christian, um, really at, at this point there, there, there was a, a very much a, a, a downward uh, trend, wasn't there, in the whole area of kidnapping, extortion, which led to prison. So can you take us down that downward path, first yeah. of all, before we turn around and bring I think, it back um, up again? Because we were dealing with criminals, um, <laughs> we didn't accept that we were the criminals, of course, but because we were dealing with criminals and they were the bad guys and they'd stolen all of this money and we were there simply to collect it, um, that meant that we felt that we were invincible. These people couldn't report it to the police, you see. Um, they couldn't go and report to the police that a group of armed men with shotguns had come into the home and stolen a few million pounds um, because they'd got into trouble. So we just had this air of invincibility which just allowed us to take more and more risks. We would uh, steal police uniforms, uh, dress up as police officers, um, take people down and brought, take s stupid risks going into uh, factory units in broad daylight and arresting people. These people were wanted by the gangsters and taking them away. They, of course, they, they soon discovered we weren't police. And um, the risk-reward ratio was quite good. We, we got a lot of money and commission, and uh, we always got the money. Um, it, was, it was very bad. I, I hurt so many men. Um, I, I really wish I could change that. Mm. And what led to the prison sentence in the end? Well, we had a friend that was owed some money and I, I, I took on this responsibility of threatening a, a man and his family that if he didn't pay this money, um, I, would, I was going to kill him. And um, this man wasn't a gangster, he wasn't a criminal. Uh, he was what we classed as a civilian. Mm -hmm. And of course he went to the police and there was so much evidence against me when the f police finally caught up with me. I had a stun gun in my car and bullets in my garage and, you know, here I was, a family man with kids, Doug. It, terrible. I never ever considered that before. And uh, subsequently, I got sentenced to prison for four years for attempted extortion. A month later, they rounded up the rest of the gang and I was taken back to court where they made me a compellable witness against my friends. And I'm ashamed to say today I w was a bit rude to the judge and I really told him where he could stick his evidence. and. I'm sorry if that offends anyone, but that's just the kind of well, idiot that I was. Yes. And uh, I got another 15 months added on my sentence mm -hmm. with contempt of court. So now here I was, and I was put in a prison called Glen Oakle Prison in Stirling, a high security prison. And um, now really, I began to think about the immediate impact my stupid actions had on my family. I got hit with the Proceeds of Crime Act, which means the government sees all your assets. My poor wife and my children were made homeless and went into temporary accommodation. And it really didn't take very long, a few months before I received a letter to say, I want, I want a divorce. Yeah. And you know, I can't blame her for that. That's right. She really needs to find a good man. Um, but actually I was just still arrogant. I thought, well, stuff you, you know, I, I don't care. Um, I was already planning my next crimes. I thought, well, when I get out of jail, I'm not gonna work for these people anymore. I'm gonna take the money for myself. Mm. And it won't take me long to have a couple of hundred thousand pounds back together. But um, praise God, he put me in that prison. Yeah. Absolutely, and I wonder, obviously, that's where we're coming to. I, I just want to make this contrast, first of all, though, that the fact that you went to prison, the fact that they gave you 
over five years in the end, the, 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 the fact that you lost everything, none of that changed you. No. It, it's, it's amazing. You could still tough it out with, mm. with all of that and, and, and still be. So what happened? Well, here I was in prison. Uh, the Sun newspaper had written articles about this guy's go enforcer. So I was all over the papers and... And uh, in prison, you have to have a bit of a reputation, you know. People will jump on you soon enough if they see that you're weak in any area. Um, what happened for me is I met a Nigerian guy in prison. His name was Tony. Uh, we're still in touch today. He lives in Canada. And uh, he was a lovely guy, Tony. But the only thing that really irritated me about him is he was a Christian. And he was always harping on about this Jesus and this God. And I really gave him a hard time, Doug. I said, you know, what kind of idiot are you? You, you know, what kind of hypocrite? You call yourself a Christian, look at you in jail like me. Your so-called God didn't save you then. I was very, very rude to him. But every Thursday in that prison, they had a, a Christian fellowship evening, a Bible study. And every Thursday, Tony would come to me in the prison yard. And uh, I'm going to try my Nigerian accent here, because <laughs> I really can't do this without Excuse thinking about Tony. Excuse us if we offend anybody at this point, please. Yes, please. <laughs> but Tony would always say to me, hello, my friend, how are you today? I would say, I'm fine, Tony. And he would say, do you know what date is today? I would say, Tony, it's Thursday. You know, are, are, are you stupid? It's Thursday. And he would say, no, it's not Thursday today. It's Christian Fellowship Day today. <laughs> and uh, every Thursday he would ask me the, uh, the same question. And actually it got to the point where either we were <laughs> going to fall out or I was going to have to go. But this one Thursday he shared with me something as a prisoner which was important. He said, you know the pastor who comes in from outside? He brings in cakes and coffees and biscuits. <laughs> And I said, <clears throat> you didn't tell me that before. <laughs> and I quickly changed my mind. Right. And I made a bit of a plan that to go along to this particular, on this particular Thursday. Now, I knew one thing about Christians, that they all close their eyes when they're praying, you see. And they had this table over here with the cakes and the coffees and the biscuits on. And well, I thought, well, when they're all praying, I'm just going to make my way to the table and steal as many cakes and coffees. And well, actually, that didn't happen because... I was impacted that evening. Mm -hmm. Initially, uh, there were 12 other men there, murderers, bank robbers, drug dealers, you name it, multiple lifers. What struck me was the fact that they were there of their own free will. And then they began to raise their hands and I'd never seen men do that before and they began to clap their hands and the pastor got out a guitar and they handed me a song sheet and I thought, oh no, you know, they're gonna sing all these hallelujahs now. It's gonna, I just wanted to get out of there. But as I looked at the words on the song sheet, it was a song I'm sure you're familiar with. It's a song called Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. Mm -hmm. And as I began to read the words of that song, I knew in that moment I was going to cry. Mm -hmm. I didn't know why. I felt it in my stomach. It began to rise in my chest. I, I tell you, Doug, by the end of the meeting, I was on the ed edge of my chair. I had the song sheet in front of my face and I, I wept like a baby. And um, I went back to my cell that night really confused. And um, I, I actually, that's the first time I spoke to God, but I, actually, I didn't invite him into my life at that point. Yeah. I said, God, if that is you, leave me alone. I don't need to be crying and, and, and weak and vulnerable like this. But I woke up that next morning in that cell, and I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was, but as the cell was opened, and on a Friday we had early lockup, that guy, Tony, was there, and he gave me a Bible. He said, John, I want you to have this. I said, I don't want a Bible. He said, please, I saw you crying last night. I said, really? He said, everybody saw you crying. That's okay. He said, I believe you've been touched by the Holy Spirit. And I said, holy schmoly, whatever, you know. Yeah. But he gave me a Bible, and in lockup that evening, I just flicked through it. And I, I would really love to read to you what Please it was do. I read. Please do. Because for the first time, I saw myself in the Bible. It was a mirror. And I, I was just flicking through it, and it opened up here in Ezekiel 18. And, uh, and further down, verse 27, it says this, But if a wicked man, if a wicked man turns away from the sins he has committed, if he does what is just and right, he'll save his life, because he considers all the offences he's committed and he turns away from them. He will surely live, he will not die. And a little bit further down, it says, Therefore, O house of Israel, and of course that's God's way of saying my people, mm -hmm. I will judge each one of you according to my ways declares the Sovereign Lord. So repent, turn away from all your offences, and then sin won't be your downfall. 
get rid of all, of all the sins you've committed and get a new heart and get a new spirit. Well, I was just struck in that moment. I, I just knew how all of the past sins that I was telling you about before, they just came back and haunted me in that moment. Mm. So I got to tell you, I, I felt haunted. I, I felt like Scrooge with all these ghosts coming. I really did. I felt haunted by these sins and, and I just knew I wanted a new heart, a new spirit. And I cried out to the Lord to please forgive me for all those men that I'd heard and all the, the rubbish I'd done in my life. And um, the following Thursday, I couldn't wait to go back to the Christian Fellowship. I'd been reading, frantically reading my Bible, reading the Gospels about the, this amazing person, Jesus Christ. And I went back to that pastor and I said, look, I, wanna, I want this new heart and I want this new spirit. Uh, but I don't know how to get it, really. I guess it was a bit like Nicodemus, you know, you're going to be born again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do I get this new heart and new spirit? And that pastor just said to me, John, you've got to be genuine and you have to really, really mean this. But it's just two things. One, are you sorry for the sins you've done? I said, yeah. He says, you know, all of us have got a body and a soul, right? I said, yeah. He said, when you die, you know, you're going to go on to either heaven or hell. There's no third place for it to go to. But the problem is, as human beings, all of us have lied once or cheated once or hated once, and we do those things, our soul becomes corrupt. This is the way he explained it to me. I said, okay, I'm, I'm with you on that one. It was the easiest way for me to understand, you see. Yes. And he said, so that means that in order to get into heaven, we kind of got to be perfect, but none of us are, because heaven's holy and God's holy, and that just means perfect. So that's our dilemma. All people have broken God's laws, then it kind of looks a bit like all people are going to go to hell. I said, well, that's a bit harsh, isn't it? How could this loving God create this place called hell? He said, well, think about someone in your life who you love very much. Imagine that person was brutally murdered and they stood before a court of law and they said, guilty. Um, he said, imagine then that that person who murdered your loved one stood before a court of law. And to your horror, the judge said, well, this is a really bad thing you've done, but because I'm a loving judge, well, I'm just going to let you off. Mm -hmm. Well, you'd be angry because there'd be no justice. So he said, hell's about justice, you see. And then he told me about two things that I could do. That if I turn away, if I really, truly repent, if I ask God to forgive me, he said, God has already forgiven you by sending his son to die on the cross, but you've got to receive that forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You've got to admit you're lost if you want to be found, John. And uh, the second thing he said is surrender your life to Christ. And what does that mean? He said, it means live it out. Obey his word and his commands. Don't just be a hypocrite. Don't go to church on a Sunday and let that be your your Christian life, live it out. Have a real faith in God, you know. If you do those two things, he says, I promise you, you'll get that new heart and new spirit. And that's exactly what I did yes. in that prison. How, how quickly did things change? I mean, you, you talked about being haunted and, and obviously you still, as you think of some of these things today, it obviously still affects you. How, did, did you know immediately everything was forgiven and everything was done and, and it was a new life or, or was that a period of time as God well, revealed that to I you? I felt a great weight lifted from me. The first thing I noticed is this heart of stone turned into a heart of flesh. I began to have a compassion that didn't exist before. Normally if somebody was on drugs, I'd say, look, don't even come in my cell, you junkie. I was very rude. Now I, I found myself saying, hey mate, you know, what happened to you? And mm. hearing the, the, the hurt and pain of childhood that they had gone through that led them to where they are today, I was just filled with a compassion for these people and um, I noticed that was a change. I didn't begin to think about crime anymore, I wasn't thinking about money. Actually I felt really good. You could have left me in jail. I could be in jail today, Doug, and I would have been happy because I felt so set free in that prison. I really didn't feel like I was in prison anymore. Some things were, were a work in progress. I was holding on to so much mm -hmm. and over time I began to let more and more go. And I can remember someone saying to me, oh, I've noticed you've stopped swearing. And of course, it wasn't where I said, I'm a Christian, I ought not to swear. It, it just fell away. Um, but a big change for me is when I got released from prison and uh, went along to church and began to get soaked up in the word. And after I got baptized, I noticed that much more fell away for me. Mm. Um, I'm still a work in progress yeah. today. And a lot of things have happened since then. You've got a new marriage, you've got yeah. a new life or, or very has, much. Has and God rebuilt has rebuilt my life, yeah. Doug, in so many ways. Uh, the first thing was, I, I really, I think the answers to prayer, my mother's a Christian, she was praying for me in prison. Of course, that Tony and of course, more importantly, God reaching out to me. 
Uh, but I also read that book, Taming the Tiger, by Tony Anthony in prison. And then he came to the prison I was in, and he, we met, and he said, I think you and I are going to work together one day. I thought, what a load of rubbish. <laughs> you probably say that to everyone. Yeah. Um, but actually, it turned out to be a good prophecy, I guess. And uh, when I was out of prison, I waited about a year. I got in touch with Tony. I joined the ministry. I began to travel around the world because I had a burning desire in my heart to, to share this good news with others. There was nothing was going to stop me. And uh, I've traveled to so many countries today. Here I am today. I, I head up the prison ministry within Avanti Ministries. I've spoken to hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Mm. God repaired my relationship with my ex-wife. We get on very well. I have a great relationship with my kids who come and stay with me all the time. I, I got married just, just under two years ago now to so a wonderful Christian girl uh, called Carolyn who just loves me so much. Mm. And uh, yeah, you know, there's times when life's hard. Of course it is. But you got, you know. you got about 30 seconds. I want you to look into your camera and just give a message to those that are struggling today. Give them a message from your heart sure. to them. Well, I just really want you to think about this, you know. You've heard what I've said today. I was really a rotten scumbag, you know. I was. I was violent. I was a criminal. But Jesus Christ, well, he said himself in Luke 19.10, I came to seek and save the lost. Amen. If that's you today, you know, I think in order to be found, we've got to admit we're lost. I urge you today, if you admit you're lost, turn your life to Jesus Christ. Mm. So, tell him sorry and give your life to him. Invite him into your heart. Okay. John, thank you so much. Thank you so much too. Bye for now.